Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, How Duncan, RB, Estee Lauder, and Talking Rain are shaping the future of research. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select the phone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. I would now like to introduce Joe Ridholm, editor of Quark's Marketing Research Review. Joe, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Insights 2020, How Duncan, RB, Estee Lauder, and Talking Rain are Shaping the Future of Research. I'm Joe Ridholm, editor of Quirk's Marketing Research Review. And just a few quick notes before we get started. You'll receive an email with a link to the recording of this event approximately 24 to 48 hours after we're through here today. And there will be time for questions after the presentation. So feel free to submit questions using the questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll get to as many of them as we have time for at the end. Our host today is Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer with Suzy. And with that, I will hand things over to Katie. Katie, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone that's joining us on this panel. This panel is designed to be one of the most informative and action-oriented panels that you're going to attend. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer of Real-Time Market Research Platform, Suzy. I partner with hundreds of the world's top brands in helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for insights that drive business decisions. I'm joined on the virtual stage by four powerhouse insights leaders, and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. Nathan, how about you get us started? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Nathan Norker. I am the Shopper Outperformance Team Lead for RB Health. Uh, basically means anything national in strategy or analytics scope. I handle that within my team, as well as Shopper Insights and all of our vendor capabilities. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Angela, how about you introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Katie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Smith, and I'm dialing in from the Great Northwest, where I lead the Insights team for Talking Rain. And we're a company that makes sparkling ice, a boldly flavored sparkling water. Um, we're a mid-sized company uh, where each of our rainmakers um, may wear several hats. So our small but mighty team um, supports the consumer and shopper insights, competitive intelligence, our innovation pipeline, and consumer engagement. And basically, we take on anything that needs the discipline of a researcher as it relates to consumers. Awesome. Caitlin, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Watson and I am a Consumer Insights and Trends Manager at Duncan Brands. Currently, I support the digital team at Duncan by leading research aimed at enhancing guest technology and mobile experiences. Um, prior to my current role, I supported the marketing and innovation team to inspire ideas and guide innovation. Um, I mostly focus on the US market and integrate macro and consumer trends within all levels of the organization. Fantastic, and last but not least, Yvette. Hi, my name is Yvette Marichal, and I lead the Innovation Insights team. I work on um, category dynamics primarily, as well as trends. And we help R&D as well as brand um, really understand what's driving force across our beauty um, categories and um, help them ideate for new products. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. So we've met our four insights leaders from four very different industries, and they all represent fairly different disciplines also. So on that note, I'd like to get us kick started with our first question. How has COVID-19 impacted insights within your company? We'll start with you, Yvette. Um, a tremendous impact. I mean, the organization has been biting at the bit to understand what are the dynamics that we can anticipate um, changes in consumer behavior. Um, and we've been doing a lot of survey work in order to um, understand, again, what is the day-to-day -day, um, changes in behavioral, um, behavioral interaction with our categories. Um, we've also been really keen on understanding social media and understanding what are the concerns of consumers. We've also leveraged third-party um, information as well to understand um, how the economy is impacting category usage and purchases. 
So um, we've done a ton of work to really keep a, a pulse on what's going on with the consumer during this hard time. That's excellent. And Caitlin, what about yourself? You mentioned your US focus rather than global focus. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about how uh, the, your insights have been impacted. So it's definitely shifted our focus. Our typical trends work of looking at behaviors and what can what consumers are eating and drinking has now shifted to really how they're adapting to COVID-19 in all aspects of their life. People are reacting very differently from each other. Their beliefs are differing right now and they're constantly changing. So early on, we identified some COVID trends that impacted us particularly, and we've then taken those trends and we've actually applied them to our innovation pipeline and even pulled forward some short-term innovation. I think more than anything, COVID has forced us to be creative and flexible with our methodology. We've done more online focus groups, and we really had to think creatively about doing our in-store consumer intercepts and all of the various taste tests that we do. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's a very change, uh, quick change in the methodologies that, that we're having to adapt to. Nathan, what about yourself at RB Health? Obviously, probably a pretty busy time for you guys. Absolutely. As you can imagine, being a health and hygiene organization, this time is extremely busy um, for us. I think like the other panelists have already mentioned, you know, we've, we've enhanced a lot of what we've been doing, trying to get a lot more out of the tools that we have. Speed has been critical for us to make sure that we have speed to insights but maintain the quality. But I think within the organization, it's more about <laughs> elevating our visibility within the organization and enhancing our engagement, right? So I think for us, um, a lot more people wanna hear from us these days as an insights lead to really help them determine not only what's happening, but what do they need to go and do about it in the future and how should they now engage with their retailer partners in a different way? Yeah, that's great to hear that now everybody's coming to you with the questions. It's uh, the Insights dream. Yes. <laughs> Angela, Talking Rain, how has Insights been impacted? Uh, well, actually, all of our teams have been heavily impacted. For Insights, um, like so many others, um, we're working remotely these days. So from a logistics perspective, we're not traveling. And the pandemic has limited our ability to execute some of our qualitative, qualitative methodologies. So we've had to look at our research plans and pivot in some cases, holding off on some planned research and adding in new research. And then as we, as we pivot, um, we're trying to keep the pulse of everything that's going on and helping be um, the master informant of the company in some ways um, so that we can act, act on those. Um, so we've seen, um, like Caitlin has talked about, just insights that we've seen we've been able to turn and um, pivot on that even from like a media spend um, perspective um, learning something new about how people are shopping and and being able to change our our digital ads and and things that we're doing that way so that we can actually act on a lot of those insights that are coming to light and i think i think that that continuum of insights to action is actually really a lot shorter these days. And so it's even more imperative that we're really keeping up to date with everything that's going on. Yeah, that's a really good point. The kind of the, the, the phrases I'm hearing all of you say are speed, agility, and action seem to be the kind of three, the three key for you. Angela, you specifically mentioned that lots of departments have obviously been affected, not just insights, but who at your company actually owns the consumer relationship? And what does that mean? Mm, great question. I, I would normally say, well, I own the consumer. I'm the one who brings it to the table. But, um, but actually, we all do. Um, last year, as a company, we, we gathered around that we were consumer obsessed, and we really focused on that consumer. Um, this year, we've evolved to community obsessed, recognizing that the consumer is not just one person at the end of the chain. It's all of the people along the chain that are affected. And, and then beyond that, um, there's a community that's larger than the people that just consume our project, our, our products. And, and so we just acknowledging that and understanding that whole community um, and how it all inter interacts with each other. So, um, so with that, it's bringing that to light across the organization. Uh, if, we're, if we're not all like tuned into that, then wherever we are along that chain, we're, we're gonna, we might drop the ball. So it's really important that we're all dialed in. Yeah, that's great. A great phrase, kind of community obsessed, not just consumer obsessed, which I think yeah. is, is wonderful. Um, Yvette, obviously, Este being such a global company, who owns the consumer relationship at, at Este? 
think we all do. I mean, we all are very consumer um, focused as well as brand focused. So um, it really is a partnership across um, CI as well as our brand folks and as well as our beauty advisors. I mean, our beauty advisors have a, a direct con connection with the consumer. So, um, you know, and, and during this time with COVID, you know, we've been very sensitive to consumers and how they feel and, and you know, what they're going through. So um, I think that, um, you know, particularly in this situation, people, the organization as a whole is very sensitive to what's going on in people's lives um, and being respectful of that um, is super important. So how do we enhance their lives um, in a way, in, in a moment where self-care is so important because mm -hmm. people are under so much stress. Yeah, that combination of kind of stress and self-care is certainly something I've seen coming out of a lot of research. Caitlin, obviously, Duncan's a, a fairly kind of comfort-driven uh, brand. Mm -hmm. um, how is the uh, consumer relationship viewed um, at Duncan? So, you know, echoing what's already been said, I think we all do at some degree own the consumer, um, but it's really consumer insights responsibility to ensure that there's one consistent and accurate voice of the consumer throughout the organization. Um, our consumer insights team, you know, we partner very heavily with business analytics and with precision marketing to really have a comprehensive story of consumer attitudes and behaviors. And more and more frequently, our team is being brought in to attend meetings that historically we haven't attend it and so we're really broadening our expertise and because of that you know using ask susie to field a quick survey for a new topic and tap into new consumer information is even more important for us right now yeah that's fantastic to hear and um, one thing angela mentioned actually last week is that now is the time for a once in a generation household penetration push and that really is the entire organization coming together for that um mm -hmm. nathan how is that viewed at rb I think if you were to ask me that question a year ago versus today, the answer would have been a lot different, right? So I think um, looking at who owns that consumer relationship would have been a very internal conversation last year from a consumer insights perspective. And my side being the shopper insights, there there was, a, was not nearly as much interaction as there is today. So I think today we need to look at what does that total relationship look like consumer to shopper. And it's more important now than ever before to, to have that full journey. Um, of understanding and really figure out how do we better partner together and work along ensuring that the internal organization and our retailers understand that full journey from beginning to end, but very different now than it was even a year ago. Yeah, absolutely. Caitlin and Nathan, you kind of both mentioned that everybody is coming um, to, to the Insights uh, team to, to find out more about the consumer and your voice is being heard far more. But how are you empowering those people across your business to be more directly responsible for kind of knowledge around your consumer? Um, Nathan, we'll continue with, with you there. Sure. So I think for us, it's making sure that our partners, both internal and our field-based folks, have full access to everything that we're pulling together and as quickly as possible. So speed, um, we know that right now any insights we get this month will be outdated um, by next month. So making sure that everything that we're doing and keeping up to speed with is fully accessible to both our internal teams and our field-based teams. That's one of the, just making sure that we are relaying everything to them as quickly as possible and that there's a repository that they can go to get the information that they need from the business at any point in time. That's fantastic, a really kind of shared shared approach. And Caitlin, how is that working at Duncan? So echoing you know, what Nathan said, we're leveraging technology, especially right now. We have an online knowledge library that houses all of our third party research, all of our competitive intelligence, all of our market insights. And we post some of our custom research on that as well. And all of the internal clients at Duncan have access to it and are trained on how to use it. We recently conducted a consumer segmentation study. And in order to really bring it to life, we identified some key times in which our business partners need to identify the consumer target. And so we developed a discussion guide of sorts for the team to collaboratively align on who the cons consumer target really is. So we're going just beyond the target segment need. We want to make sure that we identify the real consumer need to get the real why behind our innovation. That's great. That's really great to hear. And Yvette, obviously such a large company that you work for, how are you empowering the, the end users to all come closer to the consumer? You know, we're also pushing out a lot of information um, and as live as possible. Um, we've also seen an increased collaboration across 
um, CI in particular and even analytics to actually bring together a much more holistic story. So rather than um, sending out information that's piecemeal and everybody having to connect the dots on their end, we've actually been very good at providing a cohesive analysis um, that everyone can actually leverage. But it, that's been through partnerships, really, um, across, uh, across the board. And you know, it's, it's worked out really well, I think. This is a great model moving forward because um, traditionally every data point or whoever is responsible for data pushes out their own um, set and it's not always integrated into a comprehensive story. So I think we've been very successful at shifting gears and doing that. Um, so it allows our marketers, it allows the rest of the organization to have a more um, complete picture of what's going on with the consumer. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. It's less about data, more about the activation of the data is what I'm hearing from all of you. It's more so about the, the you... insight. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Um, the way that consumers obviously discover research and buy products has completely changed over the last number of months. I couldn't even num name you the number of habits that I have certainly changed. What's been one of the most interesting learnings that you found out about your specific consumer in this time? Angela, we'll start with you. Ah, <laughs> well, um, you know, I think one of the most important things right now um, is that our consumers are all feeling a lot of stress. They want relief from that stress in any way they can get it. Um, you know, shopping behaviors have changed. Um, the way we, our individual lives, we're all coming in. We might've done this um, virtually before because that's how webinars are. <laughs> But right now there's like, there's no travel. There's not even going out of the house is, is tricky. So when consumers go to the store and they're trying to do a big stock up trip and have it in less time, like, a, you know, then it, it's really been a challenge in terms of like helping understand that stress and making things easy for them. So um, understanding that it's not just the pandemic that we have an economic crisis and that we have social um, justice movements. We have a very you know, polarizing political atmosphere. We have a lot of things that are impacting. So having that relief or having the, the thing where we are, we are here to like help make their lives happier or easier or um, have a little joy in it <laughs> or, um, or just to help them meet their needs um, right now is really, really important. So, um, so I think that that has, impacted the way we message, um, but also generated a lot of empathy and also that drive to like make sure that the one last thing they need to worry about is if they go to the store, we're not going to be out of stock. <laughs> and that relies on a lot of supply chain um, support. And Nathan, I'm sure that you understand that that problem as well. <laughs> He's laughing because, of course, he has a product that I always am looking for. So Nathan, anytime you want to send me a case of Lysol, I'm open, it'd be great. I'll pull swap. I'll send you some sparkling water, you know. There you go. <laughs> you raised a good point, Angela. It's been like the resurgence of the big shop. It's no longer about picking yeah. things up on the way home from work, it's the big shop. And Nathan, over to you, kind of how has, uh, what's been the most interesting thing you found out um, other than Lysol is incredibly popular. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think if you look at the categories that we're in, right, upper respiratory immunity, um, hygiene, all of those are big pushes right now. And we see a tremendous amount of data that we've had more new households buying in than we've ever had before, right? So there's a ton of new information. But I think for me, if I were to, to narrow down one of the most interesting things that I've really looked at and seen come to life is the loyalty that we're seeing out of shoppers when they do transition to that online space, right? So there is a difference that a shopper has when it comes to loyalty within a brand between brick and mortar and .com. And so how do you capitalize on that? And how do you make sure that as you have these new buyers come in, you're getting them into the platform that you need them into so that you can get that loyalty um, within your products. So there's been, that's probably been the most interesting. You always kind of figured it was there given that you can start with your favorites on your click and collect and your past purchases, but to really see that come to life in a bigger way has been extremely interesting and really helpful for the organization to try to figure out how do we navigate this space. Yeah, that's a really good point. Again, it's that kind of once in a lifetime penetration push for businesses. So it's about those new consumers that are coming in. How do you keep them for, you know, for their lifetimes and so on? Caitlin, you must have seen so many changes in the, the consumer mm -hmm. since COVID. What's been the most interesting? 
So I think like all of us, you know, many people are working from home now or they're not working or they're working constantly. Um, so whatever it may be, their routine has been completely upended. Um, all of the day parts have shifted and the morning ritual in particular um, has really evolved for the consumer. They may not be getting their coffee on their way to work anymore. They may be making it at home. They might be having their coffee later in the day. So the whole day part really has shifted. Um, we're seeing you know, a slight uptick in the afternoon for consumers that want to come out of their house for a little break. And you know, our beverages that are popular in the afternoon are shifting. We have espresso and new products like matcha and refreshers, especially in the summer, um, being really popular at, during that time. Wow, that's super interesting. It's definitely, uh, everyone's habits and rituals have certainly changed and I'm sure beauty more than anything, it's very ritual based and skincare regime based and so on. Yvette, what do you, what's been the most interesting thing you've found um, in this well, time? Again, like the, the self-care um, has really been amplified and that really is um, very much related to skincare. And we see consumers taking way more time um, and using products to kind of help themselves be stressed and feel like they're really taking care of themselves in a, in a real thoughtful manner. Makeup is a little bit different. I mean, it's not that um, it's uh, completely irrelevant, but you know, certain categories are more relevant now than they were before. Um, and home, home, anything that has to do with um, home sense kind of creates that relaxation. So we find that like beauty is, operates on two levels. One is the whole idea of, again, self-care and self-nurturing and taking out the time. And it's also a connection to normacy. Because your, your um, schedule is completely upended, you're not getting up in the morning perhaps at the same time, you're not getting ready in the same fashion. Some people have really like um, hung on to certain um, regimens just to keep that sense of normacy. So um, it's it's been, it's been really interesting. Also, loyalty. Uh, we've also seen that, you know, um, consumers really want to go with brands that they trust at this moment in time, that are consistent, can always deliver, um, and have integrity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard this kind of phrase of kind of comfort and familiarity um, and so on, and, and stress versus self-care. Etc. One question actually came through from um, from one of our listeners and um, from Ron Zarowitz. Are you redoing your psychographic segmentation studies to capture COVID-based changes in attitudes? If that, I'll uh, pose that question to you. To me, um, we are not um, redoing our our um, segmentation because we already had um, quite a few questions that had to do with um, wellness overall. Um, so we think that most of the questions that we have um, really kind of capture certain levels of concern. So we have not thought of um, redoing our segmentations due to this. That may change down the road, perhaps next year, um, as we assess where the market is um, and see how dynamics have changed. But um, thankfully, I think our, our segmentations, the attitudes, lifestyle attitudes were pretty, pretty advanced, knowing that, you know, environmental stressors and all this is something that people that's top of mind and becoming more important to consumers. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's change track a little bit to talking about staying informed about this ever-changing consumer. Um, the consumer is obviously changing, the environment around them um, is changing, and how do you stay informed on this ever-changing um, consumer that's happening right now? Um, Nathan, we'll start with you. How do you stay informed? Sure. So a lot of that is relying on the vendor partners that we do have, right? So some of the third party vendor partners through webinars, through studies that they've been doing. It's been amazing. Um, some of the partners that we do have have been doing so much of the research within the market um, and utilizing that to stay up to speed has been extremely helpful. But we've also been really um, trying to tap into the behavioral um, partners that we have, the, the tools that we had already started to invest in that would get us things quicker and a little bit more quality. We're leaning into those even more and then really um, working through the ones where we have credit based, right? So if I think about like Susie, for example, is one where we have credits and we can kind of lean in and do some really ad hoc custom things on the fly fairly quick that gets us a little bit more robust information behind the things that our leadership or even our retailers are trying to understand. So it's utilizing a lot of the things that we were already working towards and some of our partners and webinars like this one, I've attended more this year than I have in the last couple of years combined. That's great. So kind of really leaning into those tools that you had started to, to utilize 
Yvette, is that similar for, for you? Yeah, absolutely. Our, our partners have been fantastic in terms of just keeping up, up, up to um, speed as to what work they have been doing in terms of, of, in terms of the consumer psychology, um, social media, um, social data as well. And we've been really leveraging through the um, this is our only flexible um, do-it-yourself type of um, platform. It really enables us to get underneath hypotheses that we have and understand better to what extent that is really prevalent and to what extent and how deep it runs. So it's been invaluable, actually. Wonderful to hear. Caitlin, what about yourself? How are you keeping up with the, with the, the fast changes? <laughs> So echoing everything that's already been said, I really feel like there's been this collective feeling throughout the Insights community of we're all in this together. And, you know, because of that, there's been so many great webinars, so many continuous studies that have been tracking the consumer sentiment over time. And, you know, when we do have the more specific question that comes up, we do tap into Ask Susie, um, especially to get those real time insights. And, it, in addition, it's important to just stay up to date on what's happening. Not only am I listening to the news and podcasts, but leveraging our market intelligence team, who's regularly recapping COVID's impact on the marketplace. That way, you know, we're up to date and can also understand how consumers are being impacted. So we know better what the questions are and what more to probe on. Yeah, that's great to hear. So thinking back kind of internally at your companies, obviously there's been a lot of change um, for you all. And, and I hear from uh, my clients every day that budgets are being cut, maybe teams are being restructured, leaving you to do more with potentially less. Um, and yet a lot of businesses need to engage in this kind of iterative um, process as they develop products, services. One of the questions that just came through from our listener um, regarding packaging and how everybody's kind of keeping up to speed with packaging. So you've all had to wear a lot of hats. How have you maybe adapted to that? Angela, how has uh, your role changed specifically in the last couple of months? Yeah, I've had a lot of new hats um, that I've been putting on and um, I, I never thought that I would be dipping my toe into the water of being an economist, an epidemiologist, a sociologist, an anthropologist. It just, we have to kind of pull these things all together because they all have an impact and, and there's like, there's a flood of information. We have so many helpful partners and then there's some partners that really kind of help curate. And so that we we're not like trying to just, you know, drink from the fire hose, but that we have the things that we need to look at really kind of brought to our, brought to our table. But, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's been a stretch and it's been really important that um, we have tools in place to help us do those quick pivots. And, and you talked about packaging design. I mean, this is something that we're constantly doing. Um, bringing consumer insights to our creative team is actually one of those, those new kind of connections where we're, we're trying to um, make that a, a stronger connection because there is a lot of impact from one thing to the other, how people are using it, um, the right size, the, you know, so many things, so many sensory things that happen with packaging design, but also just even the need for multi-packs. You know, when we're, when we're a beverage company, we need to think about how people wanna go shop quick, they wanna grab and go. And so that that kind of really helps, you know, kind of weave into what's going on there. But um, we've, we've been impacted where uh, as flavor and taste, and I'm sure Caitlin has the same thing where it's, it's a really important thing to get it right. And we go through a lot of, um, CLTs, the consumer location testing, and central location testing, and that's not always available right now. Um, IHUTs are pretty spendy, but they're also um, a way to get around that. Um, and it's really important for us to have that feedback from our consumers. Um, so, so we've had to shift a lot of things with that, um, but we're trying to meet where consumers are today and still be able to accomplish some of those things. And the real-time insights at Suzy really help drill down a lot of those things, get us really a lot closer to, to the mark when we're talking about hierarchy of claims, um, the benefits people are looking for, and, and, just, and just having, do you like the A-B testing right off the bat, just being able to kind of turn that on in a moment and have an audience there ready to give you feedback is really powerful and it helps us make quicker decisions. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Yeah, we really do all are having to play that 
um, that multi-hat role of epidemiologist, listener, economist, counselor, <laughs> sometimes as you as you mentioned. <laughs> Yvette how, is you, exactly. <laughs> Yvette, how has your specific role changed and have you been kind of workshopping in a different way um, over the last couple of months? Yeah, we do. Um, my team has pivoted to actually do as many workshops as possible. We've been wanting to, again, drive insights into action by working with teams and, of course, we're doing everything um, online. So um, it's actually translated fairly well. I've been very surprised and I think that Part of the reason why is that when we all collaborate together, everyone's kind of um, searching for that opportunity to work with someone, not in isolation, but actually collaborating and, and co-creating. So that's gone very well. Um, and um, again, Susie has been something we've been leveraging tremendously when we do ideate and try to test our ideas and get consumer feedback alive. So we're iterating the new ideas um, as we go. So it's almost kind of like a co-creation with the consumer, which I really love and everyone really gets all psyched about. So um, yeah, this has been a pivot. Um, it's certainly not the same as being in person, but I think, you know, we've all adapted. And I think part of it is this, you know, real desire to um, work with someone else, not just working in isolation and, and, and building something together. And everyone has that, that um, collaborative spirit right now um, yeah. because of the circumstances. That's great to hear that kind of again that community obsessed aspect is not just within our companies but really within our entire industry. I've had more insights people reach out to me the last couple of months just to ask me how I'm doing and, and how we'll be adapting. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great kind of shared community right now. Nathan you mentioned enhanced kind of visibility um, from leadership at your company. How has your specific role changed and, and what are you doing differently? Absolutely. So I've had um, more leadership engagement than I've had in quite a, a number of months and years prior to this, uh, just given the amount of information that we have and the things that we're able to do. Um, you'd ask, you know, how are dailies changing that for me that has been um, as well as getting involved within demand planning. So how does what's happening today affect us for the balance of the year? And while that has always been a very analytic slash POS kind of focus, now layering shopper insights into that and usage at home has become much more important than it ever has even in the past, right? To understand how are their behaviors truly changing from a usage perspective? And how does that get layered into what happens in the business in the longer run? Luckily, we had already been doing a lot of DM DIY spaces, we had some continuous panel type of work in a, in a new space that we were doing that has led us to have these always on engagements with shoppers, which have been incredibly powerful. And again, leads to this engagement, not only externally with our uh, retailers, but also internally with our management teams that were able to provide visibility and direction much more so than we even had in the past. Yeah, that's a really great point. Are you being held more accountable for kind of identifying actual growth um, and being held accountable in different ways? Definitely. So I think if you think about that demand planning, right, so and what's going to happen in the future, right, so we've all got our crystal ball and we're looking at it, trying to determine what that's going to be. Uh, <laughs> but I think there are definitely some shopper behaviors that help lend to what is going to occur, what we think is going to happen. And so definitely a lot more accountability from an insights perspective to say, how are we going to drive the business? In partnering with our consumer folks, we've, we've seen a lot of silos break down this year, which has been incredibly exciting from my perspective, right? So not only am I a shopper, but now all of a sudden I'm partnering with other aspects to the business much more because of the value they see in the information because of how quickly everything's changing. So with all of that happening, now it's just a time for us to capitalize on that. How do we continue to break down silos and continue to elevate what we're doing because there is a big impact on how we plan for our businesses in the future based off of what shoppers and consumers are doing today. That's great to hear. That actually probably answers one of the questions from our listener, Nancy Cox, um, asked if there's internal partners now who are reaching out to you who had never done so before. And it sounds very Absolutely. much like those silos mm -hmm. are breaking down mm -hmm. and, and our voices are being heard. Yes. Um, Yvette, talk to me about kind of the, the change in, in accountability that maybe your team has uh, towards growth for the business. Oh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, tapping into the behavioral change, the shift, what we think is actually might um, day um, after COVID um, has definitely um, made us more 
more visible um, and, and, and part of this whole idea of assessing what the future will look like, um, especially as we start, you know, um, creating new plans to make sure that that, in that future is a bright one for us as well as for the consumer. So yeah, I think overall far more collaboration, um, far more integration of information that's not just siloed um, to really provide a much more comprehensive picture of what's going on. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's permeated the entire organization for sure. That's great to hear. It sounds like the kind of the, the metrics um, are now being insights led and not just about maybe commercial revenue mm -hmm. numbers as they had been in the past. And so for all of you, obviously, as you know, we're, we're not just in a pandemic, but we're now in, a, in an economic crisis. Also, how are you balancing that pressure to kind of trim budgets, I'm sure, but also speed up your time to insights and maintain quality at the same time? Caitlin, we'll start with you about that kind of mm -hmm. iron triangle of speed, quality and cost. So I mentioned before, our research partners have gone above and beyond to keep us up to date on the ever evolving consumer. And we've been leaning a lot on the complimentary studies and webinars, you know, really that everyone's been providing for the past few months. Um, when we do have a specific question, though, we are tapping into Ask Susie. Um, it's been super critical to help us evolve the consumer needs and the consumer expectations for us and make sure that we're not just providing the food and beverage that our consumers want, but we're also commuting safety to our consumers in a meaningful way. And in addition, some of our projects are on pause. So this has been actually a good time to take a step back and prioritize using some of the new information we're getting to align the consumer needs with what's in our innovation pipeline and really focus on what we should be working on and really why do the products exist and what consumer need is it meeting? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Angela, a talking rain, how are you kind of balancing that 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 cost speed budget uh, conundrum? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a term internally we like to use and that's scrappy and it's just part of our DNA. So we're, we're kind of tuned into that already. But um, insights have never been more perishable. They're just, you know, um, they change every day. The news cycle is constantly changing. Um, we have some things that we just have to track over time and, and it changes so often that we have to be able to kind of get a beat on what's, what's happening now. Um, among those hats that I was talking about before, I think we've all been talking about the crystal ball, being able to tell the future, that futurist view is actually super important. So not only in knowing what is happening to consumers right now, but having that big picture view to look down the road and know what's gonna happen next year or what the impact of what's happening now is going to have on two or three years down, knowing that, um, product development takes time. It isn't like something we turn on overnight and go, oh, let's let's all of a sudden turn into a mask making company and we'll ship it out. It'll be great. Um, it takes time. And, and so we want to make sure we're prepared and we can get that vis visual from where we're at, what, what's happening down the line. Um, so one of the things that we've also been doing is just tapping into some of those places that we haven't been always looking at as closer late like social media um, here's where we have um, unsolicited recommendations as well as solicited recommendations but then we can take those um, viewpoints as, as like a qualitative um, research point and then take it into something a little bit more like Susie's a great tool where we can just turn it on and go now how many other people are feeling this way you know we're hearing about this now let's measure it and try and see what that's looking like across you know the entire US where our, our main market is um, and so, so we're just trying to be really scrappy, but also look at new origins of information and, and testing it out with the tools we have on hand. That's great to hear. So it's about listening and asking um, in, yeah. in partnership with each other. Mm -hmm. Yvette, what about um, for you guys with kind of budgets and timing and quality? How are you balancing all of those three? Well, I mean, thank goodness for a lot of our tools that are always on um, because that has made a tremendous difference. Um, but we've also actually taken advantage of all the wealth of work that we've done um, in the past um, few months to kind of revisit and put a new lens on and just strategically make decisions. Um, but, you know, definitely our social listening tools, um, Suzy.com, these are all like tools that we've, you know, have, um, you know, always on um, contracts 
So they've been invaluable to, to keep a pulse on things. But we have been rethinking and our partners have been giving us information as well. Um, so it's not, not, not just about um, getting the data, but it's also kind of putting on a new lens on how you're actually interpreting the information. Um, so yeah, we've been very fortunate. Yeah, that's great to hear. So whilst insights are very perishable right now, it's, as you mentioned, Yvette, it's very important to kind of revisit some of the older work um, yeah. and just, there is a new way of looking at it and, and to measure that change. So you've all kind of mentioned that you're users of DIY research methodologies. So, so thinking about methodologies, what were your initial reactions to the kind of the concept of DIY? Has that changed in 2020? How has that changed? Nathan, we'll start with you. I am a huge proponent of DIY. <laughs> Um, and there's a few reasons for that, right? So I, I always look at that as, and I talk about Susie in this frame a lot within the organization, um, is this is my choose your own adventure type of <laughs> ability for the study, right? So I can go through and, and really layer things in that allow our respondents to choose their own adventure. What, however they answer, it kind of directs them to a different question. And I can really get at the nuts and bolts of what they're trying to tell me. I think the DIY has, because of the speed, um, that I can get it because I'm putting it in on our, our teams are putting it in on their own. They can really get at what they want because of this choose your own adventure. They can really slice and dice in different ways because of as they see responses coming in and what's happening, they can start to dive into unique things that are starting to pop and see if that's something bigger. They can do follow up questions very quickly. And I think it, for me, it just comes to life and they know it better. I think when you are doing it yourself and really pulling that in, you have a much better grasp and are able to field questions on the fly, whether that's from management teams or whether that's from retailers. So a huge proponent of DIY. And I know that there are spaces for it. And then there are spaces where I just need somebody to project manage it and go run it for me. But <laughs> I think the DIY, there's definitely benefits there that are in, enormous for us. Yeah, you, you make a lot of sense there with the, if you are literally writing that question to the consumer, you'll often think about whether asking them to have a seven point scale really is going to get at the issue um, or whether it's a, it's a rate design itself. Mm -hmm. um, Nathan, you mentioned that you allow a lot of users kind of at RB to, to use the DIY platforms. How, how do you kind of balance that democratization versus the, the expertise that your team has? Uh, absolutely. So I think for us, it's actually been a very valuable tool. We get way more engagement with our uh, retailer field-based teams than we probably were even before, because now all of a sudden they know that I can bring a retailer questions directly to the SI team and they're going to get me exactly back what I need. Right. And I think it's been really powerful for us too, that I've taken the platform into now pre-COVID when I can actually go in person, right? I could take the, the platform into meetings and actually ask a question from a retailer at the beginning of the meeting. And by the end of the meeting, I'm actually giving them a response to the question that they had. And they're like, how did you do that? And, and so there's a lot of questions. I think um, you, know, you can do some things really quickly and with COVID especially and everything that's been changing so quickly. And we know that insights have become so perishable. It's really easy for us to kind of redo and recheck on things and, and the ability for our team to have that access and to do things. It's not, okay, let's all sit down and have a conversation. How are we going to use these credits? They get to run and they get to answer questions on the fly, even if they're in a meeting. So there's a lot of things that they can do that makes it much more robust for them. That's wonderful to hear. Um, Caitlin, over at Duncan, how have you guys embraced um, DIY and, and has that changed in 2020? So I, I think the need for DIY has increased significantly, especially at Duncan. Now more than ever, all organizations, all teams want results yesterday. So the instant grat gratification of you know using something like Ask Susie, it enables the internal research expert, the person that really knows about the business, really knows the critical questions to quickly design a study like Nathan mentioned and get the immediate impact from consumers. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yvette, what, what's, uh, how is it going at Este with DIY uh, and uh, democratization of market research? Um, it's, it's going really great. And again, I, I think for us, you know, the ability to kind of um, have the consumer response and co-create with them has been fabulous. Um, in terms of like having access to the platform, it's still through my team. 
Um, but, you know, we've been able to field, you know, questions so much more quickly and agilely, um, you know, turning around things in a couple of days, um, you know, is amazing and has made a tremendous difference in how we service our team. But um, the co-creation with consumers, because it really is at some point almost like a co-creative um, iteration has been really priceless to be able to do something yeah. like that. That to me is a real game changer. Yeah, many of you have mentioned to me that kind of ability to have the consumer in the room during workshops where you're asking questions, breaking for lunch, coming back and, and having that data ready and, and there for you. Um, Angela, you've mentioned a couple of different tools that you, you use. Um, I'm assuming the concept of DIY has been very well received at Talking Rain. Uh, yes, we, we do like to get in and um, be in the driver's seat. Uh, we also need to, we also um, are very careful about who's in the driver's seat because DIY tools can be great, but there's always like the thing of like, oh, who are you talking to? And making sure that you've got the right um, consumer eyes and ears. Um, and so and so we, we do internally make sure that the people who are actually act using those tools really kind of have that research methodologies and, and kind of that background so that they can, can use them effectively. But at the other at the, on the other side, there's kind of like an awareness that we have this tool and like Susie's become a verb at our, <laughs> let's just Susie it. And, um, and, you know, we can e immediately have, you know, hundreds or thousands of consumers chime in on, on being that other vote in the room for something. But it does help us um, take care of those quick turns. And it doesn't necessarily replace some of those needs where we might need those heavy, rigorous analytical capabilities that we rely on um, from other partners to help take those that burden off our shoulders um, so that we can kind of move things along while while they're really doing that um, kind of big thinking. Um, and then also, you know, writing the reports and, and, and there's also these conditions where we might have high stakes consumers that we're really trying to reach a unique group and understand a certain thing. But that being said, that's the that's been a wonderful thing with Susie is being able to constantly target and really drill down into so we, we we're talking to that exact consumer that we're really trying to understand what's what's going on for them and, and what what they need. Um, so that's that's been a powerful thing. Yeah, that's great to hear. I think there's certainly yeah. you know, there's a place for DIY and there's definitely still a place yeah. for um, advanced analytics um, and so on. So what advice when it comes to tools, when it comes to your new insights process and the new world that we live in, what advice do you have for other leaders um, about uh, about the kind of tools available to them and, and about insights, not just today, but how you see it going forward? Caitlin, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, like Angela mentioned, it's important to identify the right approach for your question. Should everything be insert DIY? Probably not. Um, especially in some larger organizations. Some questions do warrant, you know, providing, working with the best in class provider to really lend their expertise and get under the hood. There are other times, however, that you don't need a huge robust study. So, you know, having that direct line with, you know, the internal team to the consumer makes it more actionable. And you do have to make sure that you're resourced appropriately because, you know, it really doesn't get done unless you have the staff to do it. Um, but it really does create that connection both internally um, with the business partners to actually get involved. I think one tip I'd share if you're just starting to get your feet wet with DIY, if you have a traditional research approach, you know, start out using an Ask Susie, um, run the duplicate study, and then really just go back and compare it to the method and see, you know, how similar or dissimilar they are, you know, to really get your organization on board with DIY. Yeah, that's a really great, a really great to. Um example there. Nathan, what about yourself? Other advice you have for business leaders? I think for me right now, it's all about don't miss this opportunity to capitalize on the need for insights within the business. Um, working with your internal teams, working with your retailers, really to make sure that you're helping to break down those silos within the organization that may have existed. And we know that that's happening, but to continue that, how do we continue to push through and make sure that we are founding or foundationalizing everything that we're doing within the behavioral insights that we're getting? You know, there are tools, DIY, always on um, is incredibly important. Um, there's a few you know, partners that I kind of 
pulled together to really tell the whole story. And that's the behavioral, the attitudinal with the DIY and all those other things together. But don't miss this opportunity to capitalize on making sure that you are elevating the insights that you're getting to the right partners, both internally and externally, to make that impact. Because I think longer term, it's going to have a huge effect on what you and your team can accomplish. Yeah, you're so right. It's such a game changer for, for us insights people that suddenly we're being listened to. Let's make sure it continues that way. Absolutely. Um, Angela, any advice you have for business leaders? Yes. Um, I would echo what Nathan said about coming together and um, leveraging those insights across the organization, really reaching out to those cross functionals and the teams um, that can benefit from them and being proactive about that. Um, don't wait till somebody comes and says, oh, we need to know, would you happen to know? Um, anticipate those needs and think about the big picture, think about the future, think about what moves things forwards. And, and the other thing is like, don't be afraid of non-traditional approaches. There's a, there's a great opportunity here to have a creative approach and you might just be dreaming up something and it's like having partners or, or being able to kind of think, okay, if we do this, you know, just kind of rearranging things a bit, but just but just try some things out. How can you get to an answer that may have been something that would take uh, several weeks um, and all this prep and require all these things to be in place? How can we how can we do things in an accelerated way? Um, and that's leveraging new tools. We we put a lot of investment in in our our digital um, support and and technology. And so we have machine learning um, abilities where that helps us really get into understanding people in an organic way, listening in um, through social channels. Just think about some of those non-traditional ways that you can understand and get answers to those, those um, needs for the organization. Yeah, that's great to hear. And finally, Yvette, what, what uh, advice do you have for business leaders? I really think that um, we need to look at what we do. Um, our, when you're creating a learning plan for the whole year, really question how you've been doing things in the past and really start thinking through the lens of what is actionable? Are you doing things just checking them off because it's some metric that we've been constantly just accustomed to capturing? So really actually separate what needs to be done strategically, what needs to be done that may involve a much more robust type of design, you know, whether it's max diff or whether it's, you know, serious analytics versus where you can actually fill in greater depth and uh, greater layers of understanding with the consumer. So I see DIY, I, I, DIY almost like a quality quad type of tool. So where would you actually interject and maybe not do as much qualitative, do something more hybrid um, and, and question how you're going to, to, to um, really drive the business, because that's what it basically comes down to. We shouldn't be collecting data just for the sake of data. It should all be, you know, really driving to action and driving to an almost instinctive understanding of the consumer. I mean, that's what you want to do. If you're constantly on, you know, uh, your pulse is always on the pulse of the consumer, you will become instinctive uh, on, on what she or he wants. And I think that that's what insights should always be driving. And again, always to action. What does it mean to the business? How are you going to make decisions differently? Um, so I would, I would argue that, you know, we should all challenge what our, you know, regular learning plan looks like each year and assess how we can um, really serve the business better and serve the consumer better too. Because the, the reality, yeah. reality is the more intimately we understand the consumer, the better we can actually serve them. Um, in the end, that's what drives loyalty, right? It's that connection with consumer and making sure that you're meeting their expectations or delighting them in some fashion. Yeah, and certainly we know at Suzy the, the amount of new people coming onto the platform, new people who want to answer the platform, pe consumers want to be heard today as well. They want to give their feedback. They want you to know what products they want and then how they've changed. Uh, they want you to develop products for them. So uh, it's definitely a, a time for, for us to listen and consumers absolutely are, are lending uh, more weight to their voice as well. So we have a, about uh, six minutes left and we have some questions on the, on the channel. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of fire off on some of the questions. 
we answered some along the way, but one from Diana Pohl is, we hear a lot about predictive analytics and advanced analytics. So how do you see the blending of the data from primary research with predictive analytics? Um, are they being integrated into your learning plans today? Um, Nathan, we'll start with you. Uh, yes, they are. I think it's <laughs> depending upon how you build that, right? So we are um, maybe a little later than others in the data scientist realm, um, but I think that is going to be extremely important for us as we have our data lakes being built with the AI type tools, layering in the behavioral um, with the qualitative. Uh, we cannot miss some of those pieces that all come together. So there's POS that all gets pulled in, but are you layering in the behavioral into your data lakes? Are you layering in some of these other qual pieces that really pull together the more holistic story? Again, we're a little bit earlier in the journey um, than probably some of our other counterparts who are, are larger organizations. But I think for us, this is a critical piece that we are now really trying to dive deep into to make sure that our information everything that we have at our fingertips are being utilized by our field teams and those who are interacting directly with our retailers because it's all there but how do we make sure that we bring it to life for them in a usable platform yeah i think keyword there is usable there's a lot of data it's about making sense of it yes. and uh, and certainly driving the action yes another question um from the audience from paula um Ruzecki is what qualities are you looking for in your market research partners vendors um, and tools and have your expectations changed at all caitlin i'll ask that to you if that's okay of course so i think you know now more than ever there's been a we're all in this together mentality around all of the market research partners that we've had um i think you know utilizing all of the resources that are out there and you know, for some of our longer partners, you know, being able to have the conversation about what are we really trying to do and what's the business objective to help them really craft the right methodology, craft the approach as we're doing it so that, you know, I can focus more with our internal stakeholders and make sure that the business case is solid internally and know that, you know, our trusted partners can take uh, the actual methodology aspect of the research. Yeah, that's great. And another question there that kind of relates is from Susan Lustig. I think we've answered this a little bit already, but curious to hear if you are evaluating a lot of new market research partners um, or tools, or are you sticking to the kind of trusted and, and true vendors and platforms? Um, Yvette, question for you there. Yeah, we are, we're really looking at new vendors and new partners. Um, for me, it's you know, the traditional just giving data and giving an analysis is not enough. My team is really tiny. So I need partners to really help us activate it again. Um, how do you take a piece of work and not just give, um, you know, uh, an analysis, but also what, how does that um, translate into a actual action that the organization can take on? So looking for partners who are a little bit more strategic, um, who really have an understanding of marketing, have an understanding of the innovation funnel, and can really help activate um, the learning. That's great. We have time for just one final question um, from uh, Pam Goldfarb Bliss. Her question is, one of you guys uh, mentioned curating as a role um, <laughs> Uh, within within the insights. How do you see this working with primary research providers and DIY platforms and what does that role of curator mean? Um, we'll end with you, Angela. Oh, great. I think I did talk about curation. Um, it, it really means being tuned into our business, what we're trying to do, constant conversations, understanding where our challenges are and being able to know um, enough about the data that you may have or that you might have, like say for instance, a lot of um, syndicated studies and understanding the intellectual capital so well that you can say, oh, this would be helpful for you. This would be helpful for you. So that it, it really relieves a lot of that um, burden of kind of combing through and extracting things. Um, or it could be something where, you know, hey, we, we wanna know more about this particular flavor trend and, and what do you have about that? But, being able to have a partner who can go, let me go check and, and pull that together and curate it. And then just, just being dialed in closely to, to what's happening, um, that, that's really, really helpful. So um, like Yvette's talking about looking at new vendors, there's, there's always a place 
for a, a new vendor, but there's also a lot of value in the vendors that have gone along the way with you that are, they know the history, they know what you're going, what your challenges are internally, they know what your challenges are in the marketplace, and then they can help, they can help move that along. So they're really kind of deputized as our, as our insights person <laughs> that, that kind of comes along um, with, with the background that they have and the access to the information they have. So that's what I think of when I think of curation. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much, everybody. That wraps up our time for today. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists. You've been absolutely wonderful to talk to today. There will be a recording that will um, go out within the next 24 to 48 hours and uh, tune in to more Quirks webinars. We're certainly a, an insights community where learning from each other has been never more important. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Thanks, Katie.